Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> James and I, my name is Dennis Jackson. I'm the chief executive of Lord of Bench. James and I are very conscious that we're all that stands between you and your evening's event. Um, Lord of Bench, a unique investment proposition. What makes Lord of Bench unique? Just heard a couple of presentations about different investment trusts. One was emerging markets, one was property. We're extraordinarily lucky to have James, who's got a tried and tested investment approach, mildly quant contrarian value investor, that through all the market cycles has outperformed his benchmark over, over long-term timescales. The reason why James is excited to be managing Lord of Ventures money is because of this bit on the right, which is the professional services business, which in the last... Uh, talk, we, we heard about weighing machines. This is, this is a really helpful weighing machine part of the Lord of Venture proposition. This is something that was created 130 years ago. This is why Lord of Venture was created. These professional services business in today's buzzwords, this is the G in the ESG, chucks off a lot of cash. So 15% of the NAV sits over here. However, over the last 10 years, 40% of the dividends. Seven of the last 10 years, this had gone X growth. In the last couple of years, we've started to fit, put some growth into that business. Instead of coming last with the numbers, we'll lead with the numbers. So the trust has outperformed, the AIMS has outperformed its benchmark by over 42% over 10 years. We're thrilled to have him at just 0.3%. Lots of Open-ended managers might take fees of 75 basis points or 100 basis points. We think he's really good value for money, and all of our combined charges come into just 0.43 of 1%. Okay. And our focus over time is on steadily increasing income, and today's event is about investing for retirement. We think it's really important to endeavor over time to have a real business that turns off turns out real cash that we distribute to our shareholders that ideally outpaces inflation. We're beginning to get our act together there over the course of the last couple of years. You can see 2018, we increased our dividend by 9.2%, given we got some growth through the professional services business. And uh, in 2019, at the half year, we grew that by 10%. So 42% over 10 years and consistently beating the benchmark over three, five, and 10 years. We became part of the FTSE 250 in uh, April of this year. And crucially, on the 24th of May, the AIC, they, they set the sector in which we operate. They moved us to the UK equity income sector. We're very excited about that. We think it better reflects what we are as an investment proposition. So with that, I'll hand over to James. Quick baton change, because the time is ticking on. Um, I did the investment portfolio for um, Lord of Venture. If you looked at the NAV, 85% um, of the NAV is in the investment trust portfolio. 15 is in Dennis's business that he'll be talking about. But 40% of the earnings come from Dennis's bit. So for an income fund manager, it's a big treat, as Dennis said, to run it. Because every year we start, we got 40% of our income in already. So I don't have to buy I don't have to buy Imperial tobacco and get a high yield, though I'm a UK manager. Virtually everything else in the UK sector, you will see, um, you will see Imperial tobacco there. We don't need it because we've got this income already. So we can grow without going there. And, but why I really want to talk is actually because the election's coming up. UK has been out of favour. UK has been difficult. And Dennis and the Board of Lord of Venture have made a bold decision to say to James, say to me and Laura, you think the UK's value, make it count. So we have been buying UK assets in the last few weeks. Over this year, we have gone from having no gearing at all to about 8 9% geared now. And it's been buying, buying UK companies. And you haven't hissed and sent me off the stage, but on the whole, with professional investors at the moment, that is what's happening. People don't like the UK, and the, re the reasons are well rehearsed. But for a value guy, it's difficult to escape it. 
Dennis was talking about cash. Cash is what matters. The UK market gives you over 4% dividend yield. And that is so much more than these overseas markets. It's dividends, it's cash dividends that pay the gas bill. And you get more in the UK. You only get yields like this when something's really out of favor. And that's where the UK is today. We could have looked at other measures, like PEs in the UK is, is cheap in comparison. But I come back to dividends, cash dividends. And that is what we're buying in the UK today. We're, 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 the cost of money on the street, as you know, is less than 1%. These, these companies are paying over 4 And if we can believe that those dividends are sustainable, not just sustainable, but actually grow, we've got a good investment, I believe. But it's not just in the UK market that, um, that is cheap. It's actually the domestics in the UK market that are cheap. Everyone's talking about the problems in the UK. International shares within the UK market, international earnings, have performed, reason have performed well. It's been domestic UK. And for very well-known reasons, um, there was a lurch down in, in June of 2016 when we decoupled, UK earnings decoupled from the rest of the world. And that was, of course, Brexit. But Brexit has been aired, it's been talked about, and it will be resolved. And people will return to looking at UK assets, in my view. And if it's not the investor, if it's not the investor, it's the international buyers. So this year in the UK portfolio, which is 78% of Lord Adventure, um, we've had takeovers. So where, um, where companies have become very cheap, international investors are coming in to buy them. So something like Green King was a relatively large holding and it's been bought by a, a, a big investor from Hong Kong. Um, that will happen to the UK when, if it sells at these discounts to overseas, overseas markets. And what have we been buying? How have we been putting in that gearing? We've been buying some UK stocks. You know, it, they, they aren't popular. That's why they're cheap, the likes of RBS. Oh, Seven Trent, uh, there's, a, there's a chance that it gets nationalised. That's why investors can't bring themselves to buy it. You can't, people, professionals like me don't like to go to a board and say, oh, I bought Seven Trent, Mr McDonald is just going to give you an IOU that's not worth very much if you're holding. But it's not, the odds are it doesn't happen. That's, it's these moments you get the cheapness. So these are predominantly UK companies that we've been buying. What we've been having taken off us, what we've been selling this year, our companies have been being bid for. Some of these international holdings, good companies that they are, they are very expensive. So 22% of, of Lord Adventure's assets are in international companies, but we've been slowly reducing some of them where the value is no longer there. And, but we do still have, as a mixer, as companies that are really good to add to the overall mix of those UK portfolio, we still got Microsoft. There is sadly no Microsoft in the London market. There's no Toyota and Cummins, the great diesel company, is in the portfolio. So things that are really special come into this UK, into the UK, port, the, the overall portfolio to bring diversity and that we can't find them in the UK. But this is predominantly a UK portfolio and it's in the UK that we've been adding of late. Um, we, the portfolio, I like to think, is a one-stop shop for you, the investor. It is, it is a broad portfolio. There are 120 holdings in it, and we use funds when, they, when they're cheap and do something that we can't do, that we can't do well. I don't mind using, we use someone else. So Herald Investment Trust, for instance, uh, it's, it's a real good diversification to the overall mix of the portfolio. Um, these are good yielding investment trusts that are in there that were bought when they're relatively low, um, relatively low valuations. In the end, this is a relatively long list. These are the big holdings, uh, the 10 biggest holdings in the fund, but they are often UK companies, sometimes small UK companies have, that have grown, have, have reduced, have reduced, but because of their underlying growth, they, they've become relatively big. Johnson Service Group, it was 
probably best known as those Johnson on the high street um, dry cleaners. It had a very big uh, industrial cleaning business. Um, they got rid of the high street shops. It virtually went bust. Rescue rights issue. Um, it was pretty gloomy. It was really gloomy. I remember turning up to the rights issue meeting and no one, only two other investors were there. Quite a few people had called off. It's a bit like the UK market at the moment. You know, no one really wants to pay much attention to it. That was the opportunity. It's been a really rewarding investment over 10 years, reduced a bit the whole time, but it's in our top six. We will have top 10 holdings. We will have small companies that come all the way through. Um, so that, that, that's the investment outlook. This is, we are positive about the UK. Valuations are low. We need to make, take the opportunity. It's a privilege to be able to run Lord Adventure with this yield from, from, from Dennis's business coming through. I can buy some zero yielders and still be an income fund and make some of those low yielding shares in UK assets, maybe companies that are having a relatively difficult time at the moment, where the valuation is, is, has come so low, add to those, buy some new ones, and we will still be giving you, the shareholders, a good dividend distribution because we've got a large revenue reserve. We are getting the, the dividends growing from the underlying UK portfolio. And we'll go to Dennis to why his bit, his 40% of the earnings are growing, will, might grow, well in the future. Dennis. Great. Thank you, James. I feel a bit fraudulent saying it's, it's, it's my business. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be the custodian of this business, which is 130 years old. Um, and when I uh, arrived at, at the company, I always describe it to people, if a typical Lord of Bencher employee looked at the world through a pair of glasses, through the left, left lens, they saw quality of product. And through the right lens, they see quality of client outcome. And they're two amazing foundations on which to build a business. And the reputation of the business is built on independence and trust. The people that have fallen maybe slightly out of love with us were our shareholders. Even though we produced this cash, we hadn't grown the cash. We were producing consistent cash. But we were, the challenge from my board was to grow that, but not grow it in a WeWork or an Amazon or 100% or two. Just, you know... Mid to high single digits and compound that would be fabulous. And that's the trajectory that we're on at the moment. So I'm shamelessly going to pick out, because we've only got eight minutes left, the two businesses that I'm most excited about uh, within the, the portfolio of businesses that we, we run. We're going to talk a little bit about pensions and, and our, our, our whistleblowing business. But the point of all of these businesses is the, these are very strong repeat revenue. So approximately, on, when James is talking about why does he like managing money, he loves the fact that 40% of his dividend is consistently covered. Why do we feel good about that? Because when you get inside that business, about two-thirds of those revenues are contracted at the start of each year and are index-linked, right? And that's a great place to be if you've got people who provide excellent product and excellent client outcomes. So... I know you can't see this from the back. I was there a few minutes ago. But put simply, uh, at the mid-year this year, we'd grown our revenues about 7%, profit after tax 9 which is broadly the same as what we did last year. Um, and when you look at a valuation of the business, again, this is the largest investment, effectively, in, in the investment trust. right? And that's currently if you, on the balance sheet for around about £100 million. If we can grow that every year in terms of the earnings, then... Not only will that feed through into dividends, but even with no change in multiple, that will lead to a greater valuation over time. So hopefully what we can provide you is what we put on front page of the annual report, long-term capital gains and steadily increasing income, steadily increasing income. So it's been a tough hour for you. We were talking earlier on, I think, about uh, uh, envelope manufacturing businesses. I'll compete with that by talking about pensions and governance at gone five o'clock as to why you should get excited about that. I'll tell you why I'm excited about that. Is 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I was elected as a member nominated trustee of um, a Citigroup pension fund. And this went from about half an hour a week to an hour a week, to weekends, to exams, to 
professional qualifications to isn't this getting really hard? And what I found really odd about this whole experience is I was an enthusiastic amateur, one of four enthusiastic amateurs that made up the board of this company. And the professionals would come in and talk to us. They could be investment professionals or lawyers or whatever they were, give their pitch and say, well, what do you want to do to the amateur? That was a scary and very, very lonely place to be. There are some very capable independent pension trustees. I was not one of them. Happily, for the, for the people that worked at Citigroup, I no longer am one of them. But I think fundamentally, the basis of governance for pensions being done by a trusted employee of the firm, those days are over. That's the way pensions were run. These are real pools of money, and the, and the professionalization of pensions governance is, has got tremendous momentum. Pensions regulator on the 2nd of July this year put out a paper that said, should every pension scheme in the UK have a professional trustee on its board? Now, about 5,500 just DB schemes, never minded the DC, DC schemes. Um, so we think that that is, uh, well, if, if, that, if that was put into law tomorrow, there wouldn't be enough qualified people to go around. But the point is the direction of travel is irresistible. Everyone in this room, I think, has been around through different PLC board governance um, uh, mandates that have happened over the last 20 years with Cadbury reports and miners' reports. We happen to be now, we've been doing this, believe it or not, for 50 years. Our first client was Demerara Sugar. Uh, we've now got 220 of the 5,500 just on the DB side, so there's plenty of room to grow. Um, and the, the, the regulator is at our back. How do we make our money there? It's a very simple business. It's not unlike a, a law firm, right? You, you charge X pounds per hour to your client, and your costs are, are Y pounds per hour. But we think we can grow this business significantly over time because the regulator is pushing for professionalization. Uh, of, of trustees. Why is that better than an individual director? And some individual directors are excellent, by the way. But I think what our value proposition is roll up all of our schemes together and we share that knowledge, we think we can provide a superior product. Conscious of time. We'll flick through that. Whistleblowing. Me Too was the seminal moment for this business. I think the only mistake that the previous chief executive made was she bought the business about eight years too early, bought it in 2007 rather than 2015. What, what do we do as a, whistle, a provision of whistleblowing services? In its simplest form, we just provide a hotline for people to call in and share their concern. We are built around, as I said earlier, built around independence and trust. And where do we do, who does this for us? What, why do we think we can do this better than other people? You know, if you go to our website, you know, suitably slick city website, and you won't be surprised, London, New York, Hong Kong, Sunderland. And you think, what's, what's Sunderland doing over there? Now, as taxpayers, you should all be outraged because what we have is a, our entire employee base of people who are answering the phone are former policemen and women in the northeast of England, outraged because we train these people from 18 and until very recently at 48, we put them out on a full retirement package as a state. Madness. But these are people who are at the absolute zenith of their careers, are battle-hardened, and when they get a phone call in with somebody who could be scared for their life or their career, they don't have a checklist of questions. They have a process. And for former policemen and women are very, very good following that process, establishing facts, and filing a report. That governance structure, more often than not, goes around the executive of an organization. So it goes into the senior independent director, or it goes into the chairman of the board, because more often than not, it's the chief executive who's the bad guy in all of this, right? So you have to put that infrastructure in place. How do we get paid? We charge those companies a fee for, for um, the provision of the service. Okay? And if, if they go over a certain number of calls a year, then we charge on a, on a per call basis. So these are, I'm down to my last minute now, these are the two businesses that I wanted to highlight today, which are highly repeatable um, 
nature of their earnings that we think can kick off a lot of cash over time. So in conclusion, James and Laura consistently outperform over time. Pretty cheap, which ha matters these days. Yes, as James says, we've got a UK equity income focus, which has been terribly out of fashion. But we think hopefully we'll come a little bit more back in, into fashion. And assuming that we can grow this business, having been uh, flat until the last two years, that should create a wonderful weight of cash that we can distribute to our shareholders over time and help see through them through retirement. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you.